So we are going to start the last session for uh, this conference. The topic is Standard Essential Patents and Friends. Mr. Kim dong the judge from uh, the Patent Court of Korea, will be the moderator. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's the second day of the conference, and we're going to have the last session. I am Kim dong the judge from Patent Court of Korea. First of all, I would like to introduce the speakers and panels for the session. Please welcome them with a big round of applause. First of all, we have Judge Daniel Alexander from the UK. Judge Bansi Venko from the U.S., Judge Contre Professor Contreras from the U.S., Judge Chui from China, Judge Granata from Belgium, and Judge Kim Gisu from Korea, who is here with us uh, on site. Judge Kumagai from Japan, Judge Shout from Germany, and Judge Woo sung from Korea. As such, we have invited world-renowned judges and professors as panels, and I am honored to be with them in the session. All the foreign speakers are here with us online on a real-time basis. I would like to thank the speakers, especially Judge Alexander from the UK, Judge Schaut from Germany, Judge Granata from Belgium for being with us here today, although it's um, 2 a.m. in your own country. In the session, we will talk about standard essential patent and friend commitment. In the session, the speakers and panels sent us prior answers, which are all summarized in the reference book. So please refer to them for more information. And we have many speakers for the session, and we have many detailed topics to talk about. So I'd like to ask you to understand that we are not giving you enough time for making comments. I'd like to ask all the panels to finish your answer in time. After we finish all the presentations and comments, we will take questions from the floor. Due to time constraint, let me start with the first topic. First topic is the legal nature of standard essential patent and friend commitment. The common denominator in disputes regarding SEP is often the meaning and interpretation of friend commitment. So would you please give a brief outline of the discussions taking place in your own country regarding the legal nature of friend commitment on any related cases as well. We would appreciate very much if you respond within three minutes. Um, Professor Contreras, would you first answer this question? Yes, I would be delighted to. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, very distinguished panel and talking about this topic. Friend commitments are in the United States and around the world really created through the voluntary adherence of members of a standards development organization to the policies of that standards development organization. One of the policies of these organizations is often to license patents on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms or FRAN terms. Um, however, there is a broad range of standards organizations operating in the world, quite a few different methods of adhering to their policies and making these commitments. Some have agreements that must be signed, some have policies that are simply uh, part of the organization's formational documents. Uh, some commitments are made in purely voluntary statements. Uh, so it is difficult to generalize about the legal character of these commitments. 
Uh, however, for the sake of simplicity, um, I will talk about these as contractual commitments. Uh, this is mostly because some of the more heavily litigated uh, SDO policies around FRAND have been found to impose contractual commitments on their participants, um, going back to the US cases, Apple versus Motorola and Microsoft versus Motorola. So if we take for granted that an SDO policy imposes a contractual obligation on participants, then we look at what that commitment requires. Uh, the details, of course, are in the policy. However, not all policies are very long or very clear. So we find two general categories of obligations. Obligations around the process of negotiating the FRAND license and obligations around the content of those uh, commitments. The process obligations generally require the parties to negotiate in good faith, um, to continue negotiations for some period of time, possibly to refrain from seeking injunctive relief during that negotiation, um, and possibly to submit disputes to some sort of adjudication. The content obligations that exist relate to how high the royalty rates must be and what the other reasonable terms are in the FRAND license. Usually there is some combination of this process and content obligations. Um, there are examples in numerous US cases of this. TCL versus Ericsson is one recent one um, in which Ericsson, the SEP holder, was found to have negotiated in good faith and its conduct did not violate the FRAND obligation of the standards organization. However, the rates that it proposed did violate the FRAND obligation. They were above the FRAND obligation. Um, and so uh, you can have both process and content in tension. Um, that I think is about all the time that I have. Uh, there are certainly more details on this very interesting topic in the written response to the questions. Thank you very much, Professor Contreras. Let's listen from uh, Judge Schaut from Germany. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for having me here at this uh, session five. Very interesting question. From a German standpoint, um, it is a very interesting question because in Germany, um, this question is not at at least at the moment, not in the middle of our discussion. Um, however, we see that um, it, is a, it is a problem um, how to deal with a uh, friend commitment. I would say there are uh, two opinions how to, um, how to assess the legal nature of friend commitment. The one would be uh, it had, has only a declaratory char character, so it's not binding at all. The other um, uh, solution would be, yes, it might have a uh, uh, legally uh, binding uh, character. So it's a contractual uh, uh, sort of thing. Um, the thing is in, um, uh, in Germany, um, if, we have a, um, if we have a standard essential patent, uh, we usually um, uh, solve the problem with, or the, the, the case uh, applying uh, the EU anti antitrust law and the, the uh, in the um, uh, applying the cases of the federal of the uh, uh, court of the of the European Union and um, one problem which arises when we come to the question um, does a friend commitment has a, a, a legally binding character we have to assess uh, the, uh, the 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 the, um, the country to which uh, these um, uh, a commitment uh, shall govern. So the problem would be that in a lot of uh, uh, declarations, uh, it is not set which uh, which law of which country uh, does govern this uh, this commitment. And so um, it might be that in, in in a case we would have to uh, to to find out which law of which country 
uh, has to be applied to see whether uh, it is in what kind of uh, contractual commitment um, is this front commitment. So um, there are um, some declarations. I think it's, it's Etsy, which uh, says that um, uh, the declaration has to assess under French law. There are other um, um, uh, organizations which does not say at all which uh, law has to be applied, which gives the judge in, in Germany some uncertainty, which we do not like. Um, I would say that's uh, so far from me uh, to, to, uh, to make it short, I would say it front uh, commitment, the nature, um, it is not in the middle of the discussion in Germany. Why, why not? Um, because uh, if we have a standard essential uh, uh, patent, uh, we apply the uh, EU antitrust law. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. And next, we'd like to listen uh, from Judge Granata from Belgium. Judge Granata from Belgium, would you answer the question? I don't know if it's my turn to speak because I don't hear, uh, I don't have a good connection, I guess. But uh, anyhow, um, thank you for having me. First of all, I have to address the issue that in Belgium there are, there are only some pending cases regarding France. So uh, my answer are based on my uh, personal experience, examination of foreign decisions, but also being a member of the EU Expert Commission Group on France which uh, will issue, I guess, within the next weeks its final report in which you will find diverse structural uh, reforms regarding the process of transparency of information negotiation process and procedure. Regarding the legal nature of SEPs uh, France, uh, I can refer also what Professor Contreras and Mrs. Schacht already uh, pointed out that an important element is, of course, the law to be applied to assess this issue. The commitment is to be found in the contract, the IPR policy between the SAP holder and the SDO. And uh, this contract normally stipulates applicable law. As already mentioned, by, for example, by Mr. Schacht uh, for Etsy, this is French law. And if you go, would go into... The contract for the commitment for the benefit of uh, third parties. However, there is the contract states an obligation in the form of a benefit towards him as a third party. The third party can make use of this contractual obligation, this front commitment. There are some conditions which have to be met. Uh, I won't go into these conditions in detail. You will find them in the questionnaire. Um, but it is important. I, I really want to stress that we have to go. The first step we have to take is, of course, the applicable law issue. And we have to go into the applicable law to examine whether or not uh, which law applies to this commitment. And I think the Lex Forum normally is not that suitable. And we should uh, look into the IPR policy of the um, contract between the SAP holder and the SDO. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Next, we'd like to listen from Judge Kumagata from Japan. Yeah, uh, everyone. Yeah. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to participate in this uh, great event. So uh, let me briefly introduce the uh, Japanese discussion on this matter. Yes, and uh, in uh, Samsung versus Apple case, uh, rendered by the uh, grand panel of IP High Court in 2014, uh, by interpreting uh, contents of the EPSI's IPR policy and French law applicable to that policy, the IP High Court concluded that the grand declaration in the, ca in the case should not be considered as an offer for license agreement. The IP High Court further held that the 
shareholder who committed front regression undertakes an obligation to have a good faith negotiation with willing licenses. Uh, however, uh, I'd like to stress that uh, this court findings in the Samsung versus Apple case was made on a case by case basis. As uh, the other uh, panelists already pointed out, the assessment of the legal nature of brand commitment, I think that uh, should be made uh, closely examined on the, uh, the contents of the uh, commitment and the applicable law. So uh, that, uh, that, that is that is end, end of my answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Judge Kumagata, for your answer. Next, we'd like to listen uh, from Judge Chui from China. Okay, thank you very much. I feel very honored to attend to this conference. The two main views of the legal nature of brand in our country are to regard it as a unilateral legal act or as an invitation for offer. I think both of two views are reasonable and effective. The main problem of the view of unilateral legal act is that a unilateral legal act is generally a clear, clear declaration of will, such as gift, waiver, and only set a burden on the doer himself. But a friend does not contain congrat, content Seems like uh, there are technical issues with the connection, so Judge Kisukim, would you please, please first answer the question? Thank you, Judge Kisukim. Thank you, Judge Kisukim. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kim Gisu from Spring Court. It is my honor to present and answer this question in this conference. As you may well know, standardization has many advantages in increasing compatibility, but SCP holders may have some disadvantages, and you also have SAP holders may also have a position that will have market dominance that could be well likely abused. So non-discriminatory commitment versus friend commitment is in the place in place and it is a safety net to prevent the SAP holders from abusing its position. It is a kind of a commitment to license the terms of the SAP to the implementers of the SAP. So as many people already said before me, the contents of a friend in governing laws should be considered to determine whether there is a breach of the friend commitment. In Korea, in the patent litigation between Samsung Electronics and Apple, the sole 
브랜드 조건에 따른 라이센스 계약 체결을 위해 성실하게 협상할 의무를 부담하는 것이라고 판단했습니다. 법원은 브랜드 화격이 제3자를 위한 라이센스 계약의 청약이거나 침해 금지 청구권의 포기에 해당된다는 주장을 받아들이지 않았습니다. 삼성 애플 사건은 브랜드 화격과 금지 청구 가능성에 대한 이 주제에서 보다 상세히 다룰 예정입니다. 2019년 퀄컴의 공정거래법 위반 사건에서 서울 고등법원은 퀄컴의 프렌드 화격의 의미에 대해 프렌드 조건에 따라 성실하게 협상하고 라이센스에 대해 의무를 부담하는 것이라고 판시했습니다. 이 사건에서 법원은 퀄컴이 경쟁 모뎀 칩셋 제조사에 라이센스 제공을 거절한 행위를 브랜드 화격에 위반한 행위로 보았습니다. 이 사건에 관해서는 브랜드 화격과 공정거래법 위반에 관한 한 주제에서 보다 상세히 다룰 예정입니다. 감사합니다. 김 교수 판사님, 답변 감사합니다. 어, 중국의 추이 판사님, 혹시 답변 준비되셨습니까? Thank you. Uh, Judge Chui, are you ready to answer the question? The two main views of the legal nature of friend in our country are to regard it as a unilateral legal act or as an invitation for offer. I think both of two views are reasonable and effective. The main problem of the view of unilateral legal act is that a unilateral legal act is generally a clear declaration of will, such as gift, giver, and only set a burden on the doer himself. But the friend does not contain congrat content, and the willing licensee also have obligations in negotiation. The main problem of the view of invitation for offer is that a SCP holder make a friend commitment does not mean he is willing the others to make an offer to him. So the courts tend to avoid directly stating the nature of friend commitment in judgments. And we don't take friend as a contract for the benefit of third parties because China's present contract law only provides that the parties of contract may agree that the debtor shall perform his debt to a third party. But this is not an article about the contract for the benefit of third parties. The third party does not have the right to request performance. Today, I would like to talk about the possibility. China's civil code will come into force next year. According to Article 522 of China's civil code, the parties can agree that a third party may directly request the debtor to perform the debt to him. And if the debtor doesn't, the third party may request the debtor to assume the liability for breach of contract. So some scholars think that since there is legal basis, we can regard friend as a country, contract for the benefit of third parties. No matter what the legal nature of friend commitment is, the consensus is we should consider both parties' behaviors in lawsuit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have you finished your answer? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Judge Alexander, would you like to say something about this topic? Would you like to add? Judge Alexander, would you like to say something about this topic? Thank you very much. And again, it's a great honor to participate in this session. Uh, two very short comments. First, in English law, the approach is similar as a matter of legal theory to that of United States law, namely that the friend uh, commitment uh, is a contractual commitment. Precisely what the content of it is will depend on the nature of the contract uh, and the law by which it is governed. However, the approach that the English courts have taken is that essentially it's a contractual commitment that can be used by an implementer as a defense to patent proceedings in these circumstances. 
the English court will regard itself as a, an appropriate forum to determine what the FRAND terms are, and if those terms are offered by the SEP holder and they are refused by the implementer, then the English court will grant an injunction normally in relation to the SEP. So this, the practic practical approach that the English court takes is much more similar to that that it would take in the context of collective copyright licensing or licensing of a patent under a uh, patent that is declared to be license of right, even though the commitment in question is a contractual one. All of that comes from a long decision of our Supreme Court earlier this year in a case called Unwired Planet, of which uh, I have summarized the details uh, in the notes. And there is considerable developing case law on exactly how the brand commitment is to be worked out, uh, which uh, will be done in future case law in the coming years. Thank you for your answer, Judge Alexander. Here, all foreign speakers and panels are participating in the session online, so we have some technical glitches. Please understand the situation. And second topic. The second topic is the remedies for the infringement of SCP. The first question is, when a third party uh, uses an SCP without a license agreement, the question of what means of relief are available to an SCP holder is a critical issue. Then, can a friend committed SCP holder seek an injunction against an implementer? Please explain any standards or factors to take into consideration when deciding whether or not to grant an injunction sought by an SP, SCP holder. I'd like to ask you to answer the question in three minutes. First, Judge Chui from China. Okay. Some foreign patentees like to file lawsuits of patent infringement in China. One of the reasons is that they think it's very easy to acquire an injunction. That's kind of true, because in our opinion, to cease the act of infringement is the basic liability of the infringer. In SAP infringement lawsuits, because of the friend commitment, more factors should be considered, but the injunction can also be granted. In the judicial interpretations issued by the Supreme People's Court, the rules are described as if the patentee deliberately break friend, resulting in the failure to reach a license agreement, and the accused infringer is without a parent vote, the patentee's request for injunction should generally not be supported. In the judgment of Xi uh, Dian Jietong, uh, which is also called IWNCOM versus Sony, a more detailed explanation was given by Beijing IP Court, which is if the implementer doesn't have vote in negotiation, no matter the patentee has vote or not, the request of injunction should not be supported. If the implementer has vote, that depends. In the case that the patentee doesn't have vote, an injunction will be granted. In the case that both, party have, both parties have vote, we balance the interest of both parties based on their vote to decide whether to grant an injunction. And Guangdong province high court's opinion is a little different in its guidelines. In their opinion, in the case of no vote of both parties, a reasonable assurance should be submitted by the implementer to avoid the injunction. When judging the fault, we consider the time, the way, the content of negotiation, and the reason of deadlock or break of negotiation. 
and the business practices of, of existing SEP negotiations are also important references to decide which party has fault. Thank you, that's my answer. Thank you very much for your answer. Judge Kumagai from Japan, are you ready to answer the question? Please. Yes, okay. uh, yes uh, sir. The, in the Samsung versus Apple case, the, the grand panel of the IP High Court uh, took the so-called uh, the <coughs> abuse of right approach on this issue. Under this approach, a self-holder who committed a friend declaration is basically prohibited from seeking injunctive relief against the implementer of SEP. In other words, uh, by expressing willingness to enter into a front license agreement, the implementer can evade an injunction. However, if the uh, implementer fails to establish the fact before the court that uh, the implementer is a willing licensee, an injunctive relief can be granted to the SEP holder. The court determines uh, whether the implementer has genuine willingness or not, uh, comprehensively considering uh, various factors appearing in the case. Not only its implementer's actions during the negotiation process, but also the SEP holder's actions are taken into account in deciding whether the injunction against the implementer is permissible or not. I think uh, that this uh, comprehensive approach uh, gives a wider discussion to the court. But however, it can be said at the same time that uh, uh, the ambiguousness of this approach impairs the productivity of the parties. That's the end of my answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your answer. Next, Judge Woo Sung Yeok. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Woo Sung Yeok from Beijing Court of Korea. First of all, I am very pleased to be with world renowned judges and experts in this session. I would like to explain about the injunction claim under the Korean patent law. So, the Korean Patent Act defines that only infringement of patent rights is the condition for a petition for injunction against patent infringement. So even the SEP holder made friend commitment, he can request an injunction against the implementer. But if it is regarded as abuse of power, then the exercise of claiming the injunction against the patent infringement could be restricted. And there is no precedence um, ruled by the Korea Supreme Court for whether or not the petition for injunction against patent infringement uh, was permitted. But in the Samsung Apple case, the Seoul Central District Court made a ruling that between willing license and unwilling license, there should be a clear distinction. As for unwilling licensee, there is um, almost no restriction on the exercise of the, the injunction for infringement of the patent. And the SEP holder has the duty to negotiate the license in good faith with a willing licensee. And until such uh, negotiation is completed, the SEP holder should not claim the injunction against the patent infringement. And also in this case, the licensee should be the willing licensee. In the Samsung Apple case, 
There have been several conditions mentioned to determine whether the implementer is an unwilling licensee. The first element is that the defendant should be aware of the existence of standard patent and the defendant's implementation of the patent invention, but uh, use the license without any request or consultation with the patent holder to grant the license. The second condition for unwilling licensee is that if the if, if the standard patent value was excessively underestimated and there is a difference between the defendant's proposal of the initial royalty rate and the normal ordinary royalty rate. And also when the defendant has not proposed any deposit um, equivalent to the royalty rate. These are the conditions for assess, uh, determining the unwilling licensee. Uh, Judge Granada from Belgium, are you ready to answer? Please. Uh, yes, I'm ready. Um, I hope you understand me. First of all, I think as an introductory note, I think it's important to note that in at least at, in European patent convention, in law, there is not such a thing as a standard essential patent. A patent is a patent. So normally the friend commission, commitment as such does not provide an implementer a right to use an SAP. It states that the holder should uh, commit himself to offer a willing implementer a license on front terms. If such a license has not been agreed upon, the SAP holder should, in principle, as every patent holder, be entitled to be granted an injunction. Under Belgian law, um, and I think most uh, laws, you have principles as something as misuse of rights, and that's where uh, the judge can decide that actually the implementer uh, the SAP holder is not empowered um, to use this right uh, because he misused the right throughout the process. Um, it is difficult without having any specifics on an actual case to provide the standards, but elements which could play a role, for example, could be uh, unnecessary excessive confidential agreements asked by the um, SAP holder, not giving sufficient information regarding the SAP and or the portfolio for the implementer to examine the potential infringement and or essentiality, and not providing sufficient information regarding the calculation of an offer or rejection of a counter offer. Um, should the breach of the friend commitment be considered as a misuse of right, an injunction normally will still be granted, but could be made conditional, conditional on specific terms. As already mentioned by the um, by a speaker before me, uh, the willingness and unwillingness is something which is very important. Again, it's a very factual element, but uh, based on examination of some uh, decisions, maybe as unwilling, for example, could be declining to use ADR to solve the dispute, uh, could be challenging the essentiality or patentability of a proven as a SAP proven should be understood as a factual circumstance where, for example, several other EU courts would Seems like technical glitches are happening again. Judge Granada, have you finished? Your comments? But I think in the questionnaire you will find the examples. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. Next, uh, Judge Shout from Germany. Are you ready to answer the question? Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah. <clears throat> I had actually uh, three comments on this topic. Uh, first will be on the injunctive relief itself in Germany. Uh, second will be uh, the application of the injunctive relief in so-called SEP cases. And third comment will be on an um, uh, amendment, a recent amendment of the German Patents Act. 
So uh, first to the injunctive relief um, in Germany, it is uh, so-called um, automatic um, injunctive relief, which means uh, if the requirements of injunctive uh, of an injunction are fulfilled, um, there is no further um, uh, discussion uh, whether it has to be granted uh, or not. However, um, also the injunctive relief needs to be proportionate. This is not uh, that is not a written requirement, but an inherent requ requirement. But um, uh, currently, the overwhelming uh, opinion uh, of German courts, um, outlined by our uh, Federal Court of Justice in a decision called uh, Wärmetauscher, you can find it uh, in my written answers. Uh, so the opinion is that the situations in which an injunction in German patent law is not proportionate. Uh, is very, very seldom, and the, 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 um, uh, the reasons need to be very, very special um, to, to, to make an uh, exemption from the automatic injunction. So, uh, to the um, uh, second comment uh, on, um, on the special situation of SEP, uh, um, um, SEP cases, um, in Germany, of course, uh, we uh, will assess when we have a, an, an SAP holder assuming an uh, implementer. Uh, first, we will assess uh, do we have patent infringement and is the, uh, is the patent, uh, in, is the patent uh, supposed to, to be valid? I say uh, it is supposed because, as you may know, in Germany we have a bifurcation. So at the, uh, we as infringement judges, uh, we only we, we, we take a we take a we take a look, but we do not decide whether it's valid or not, the patent. And um, uh, the third uh, thing we will see um, uh, in this SEP cases is um, whether the, um, the defendant, the implementer, is a willing licensee, yes or not. Is a very um, 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 uh, yeah, the current uh, discussion here in Germany, we have a, we have a, a, a judgment from our Federal Court of Justice um, and it is highly, highly uh, discussed in Germany, what are the, the real uh, followings of this, of this discussion. So we will see uh, whether the um, uh, implementer is, uh, uh, is a willing licensee, then we will uh, not, uh, then we will refuse the claim. Um, and we will, uh, and if he is a willing licensee, we will see whether the uh, the um, uh, whether the SEP holder uh, has uh, uh, has uh, um, 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 uh, oblig has um, um, I'm sorry uh, w was uh, w was uh, doing his uh, obligations uh, according to front whether he was uh, um, offering a friendly um, um, conditions to the to the implementer. Um, then we have. Then I would uh, I would come to my to my uh, third comment. Um, <coughs> as you may know, we have a lot of uh, SAP uh, cases in Germany, and uh, at least uh, the legislator, our government, um, has seen some some need to 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 amend uh, the uh, injunctive relief in Germany. Uh, it was also highly disputed. Now it, it is clear that there will be an amendment of the injunctive relief, um, which will emphasize the aspect of proportionality within the injunctive relief. Uh, so it will say uh, to the, it will actually says, say um, the automatic injunction is still uh, the, uh, uh, is still the, uh, uh, the norm, the, the, the normal case, but uh, as court you have to look whether it is in this, in this, in the case you have to decide whether it is proportionate or not. Please do so court, please, please assess it with more uh, with a more more eager, um, yeah. This is this is my comments. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Judge Schaut, for your answer. In the case of Germany, they're emphasizing that um, point. And Judge Alexander, are you ready to answer? Yes. Thank you again. So similarly to uh, other jurisdictions in the United Kingdom, uh, infringement and validity of a standard essential patent has to be established first of all, before you get into considering whether there is um, a, a, a brand determination. Uh, as uh, in uh, what is proposed to be the German law, in the United Kingdom, it, patent injunctions are almost automatic, 
but proportionality uh, is taken into account. More commonly in cases involving, for example, life-saving drugs and so forth, less commonly in other cases. In uh, brand cases, a uh, brand committed SEP holder can seek an injunction if an implementer uh, doesn't take a license which has been determined by the uh, court to be brand. And the courts have said that uh, uh, in those circumstances, the implementer is standing before the court with an infringed patent, has the means to obtain a brand license, but has refused to uh, take that license and therefore an injunction will be granted. So far in English law, there has been less focus on the issue of willingness or unwillingness historically uh, of uh, a, a licensee. So in the leading case in Unwired Planet, um, neither the SEP holder nor the implementer had made a, an offer which the court regarded as brand. But th the court was able to solve that problem by determining for itself what was brand. And uh, once that was determined, the implementer had to take that license unless, uh, in order to avoid an injunction. There are, however, a number of issues outstanding similar to those just mentioned by Judge uh, Schacht uh, relating to the unwillingness of a, a licensee. There are cases even currently in the last few weeks uh, in the English courts where directions are being made to determine whether a licensee is unwilling if they do not commit in advance to taking a license settled on terms by the English uh, court. Now, the procedure uh, uh, for that is a bit up in the air at the moment. Uh, whether that will happen in that way is at the moment not clear, uh, but there will be some developing case law in that area in the next six months. Yeah. Thank you very much for your answer. The case of UK, they apply uh, different regulations to the life-saving drugs. And Judge Bansi Bengo from the US, are you ready to answer? Yes, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this. And I'm pleased to be here to provide a little gender diversity as well to this panel. Um, and the question of injunctive relief for Fran patent for SEPs is an interesting question. Injunctions in the United States are a matter of equity. So although we talk about these things in terms of contract, in most instances, they are contracts without the necessary material terms where you could simply say you're in breach, here, pay the damages and move on. So when you come in and your, your obligation under Crand is to negotiate in good faith, then it does get back, as Judge Alexander said, to the question of, well, are you negotiating in good faith? And that's, that can be part of an equitable determination as to whether there's irreparable harm to the patent holder because they've given up this, this technology with the expectation people will take a license um, and if someone's just refusing to do so uh, and not negotiating at all, I think it will strengthen your position as a patent holder to enjoin them and not let them just be free riders. It becomes more complicated if there are offers on the table and particularly if it's early on in the context of a preliminary injunction and you have very little information as to what a reasonable licensing fee would be for this particular implementer um, and and each side is trying to tell you well their offer is fair and the other side saying no um, then you don't necessarily have unwilling people you just have a dispute for the court to decide i think in that context courts should consider uh, exercising their equitable um, opportunities and, and authority to suggest uh, payments made into some escrow account so that um, the person who wants to implement 
is meeting their obligation to make a payment, and the final amount would then involve some settling up at the end, uh, either for a refund or for additional payments, uh, but that there's security to the patent holder that they will be paid for this use. Those are ways to sort of work around it, but the court has become very clear here, certainly the Federal Circuit, that, that we can issue injunctions to SCP holders uh, in the proper equitable circumstances. So that's, um, I think that's probably my three minutes. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. 다음. Now, this question goes to Judge Alexander. As we understand, if SCP infringement is recognized, the conditional injunction order is issued that actually happened in the UK. Could you introduce this case in three minutes? Judge Alexander. Yes. So the uh, only case so far that we've had that has gone all the way is a case called Unwired Planet and uh, Huawei and ZTE, which was decided by our Supreme Court uh, earlier this year. And it confirmed the earlier decisions of uh, Mr. Justice Burse and the Court of Appeal that uh, the English court could uh, both settle brand terms on a worldwide basis and if those terms were not taken by the implementer to grant an injunction on the basis of valid and infringed patents uh, in the portfolio. Uh, and uh, that, that has given rise to a number of issues, some of which we'll touch on in the later sessions, uh, as to, well, what is the right approach to uh, brand uh, uh, a determination and some of the procedural issues, including on confidentiality, which one of the other speakers uh, has mentioned. There is one qualification to this, just for uh, information. We have had two cases in uh, the United Kingdom where implementers have said, we will agree to leave the United Kingdom market uh, and uh, so we are not interested in taking a brand license settled by the United Kingdom Court. And in those circumstances, the United Kingdom Court has said, we can't force an implementer to take a license. So for example, one covering the past, we can only deal with back damages and the principles on which back damages are to be assessed for a United Kingdom patent are themselves the subject of current dispute um, in uh, two cases, uh, one of which is, I think, this week, possibly going to the Court of Appeal. Yeah. Alexander, Alexander Thank you for your answer. Regarding this, I'd like to say that in the case of the UK, the, it says conditional injunction is recognized. As you see on the slide, it says conditional injunction is recognized. And he sent us an email that the UK conditional injunction is different from the US. So we actually had to change the, the mark. As he mentioned, the injunction can be made on the condition that the implementer refuses to sign that um, license. So the way the UK gives um, recognizes uh, conditional injunction is different from other countries. And the second one is about damages. As a remedy for the SCP infringement, there are many issues unique to the determination of the amount of damages for SCP infringement, exclusion of value added from standardization, 
and assessment of non-discriminatory and reasonable royalty rates, impact of breach of friend commitment by an SCP holder in the assessment damages and many others. When you assess the amount of damages for SAP infringement, um, could you introduce factors that are specially considered specific methods uh, in three minutes? Judge Chui from China. Yes, I'm glad to answer the questions of this topic in two parts. Uh, the first is how to consider special factors by traditional methods to determine the amount of damages in ICP lawsuits. Because as far as I know, there is only one case in which the court award damages, and it's, it's by traditional method. Uh, some factors can be considered by traditional method, for example, about the royalty stacking in the judicial interpretation of patent infringement, the Supreme Court People's Court rules that the profit produced from other rights should be excluded. And if the infringing product is a part of other product, the court should determine the amount of damages based on the value of this part itself and its role in the product's profit. And about unwilling licensee, in the only case of avoiding damages, the defendant was regarded as an unwilling implementer, and the court awarded triple of royalties of other licensees. But that's not punitive damages. That's a general provision of China's current patent law, uh, which is reasonable multiple of royalties. And as to the value of uh, SEP, the general view is that its value includes only the inherent value of the patent rights, but not the value added from standardization. Because the patentee's contribution is just the innovation of technology, but not the standardization. Because it's not judicial pricing of royalties, so we can take all these factors into account just as as what we do in other patent infringement lawsuits and make our discretion. However, the defect is that it's not accurate, it leaves too much room for discretion, and the royalty is still not settled. And the second part of my answer is beyond infringement lawsuits, there are several methods of calculation in determining royalties. For example, in Huawei versus IDC case, the court used comparable license approach. In Huawei versus Conversant case, the court used top-down approach. And in Huawei versus Samsung case, both of the two approach are used. So they could also be methods of determining amount of damages. But I think that depends on the plaintiff's assertion. If, we, if there is no assertion, no information, no evidence, the only method to determine the amount of damages in the traditional way with special factors taken into account. That's my answer, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Regarding set infringement and its damages, there's no special uh, rules in China. They follow the reasonable reasoning and reasonable royalty is assessed. So thank you for explaining about how you calculate the amount of damages. Next, I'd like to ask um, Judge Kumagai from Japan. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, according to the Samsung versus Apple case um, in Japan, a self-holder is basically able to seek compensation for damages equal to a friend royalty. And uh, in the case where the self-holder established a fact that the uh, an implementer is an unwilling licensee, the stakeholder is able to seek damages exceeding a fund reality. And on the contrary, if the court um, 
evaluate the stakeholders' actions during negotiation process as extremely unfair. The stakeholder is prohibited from seeking compensation for damages, even equal to a planned reality. And uh, secondly, and concerning the methodology for assessing the planned reality, uh, the IP High Court took so-called top-down approach in Samsung versus Apple case. Uh, please refer to my little answer for the detail of this approach. Uh, it is said that uh, based on this approach, the IP High Court determined the loyalty rate of the disputed step for iPhone 4 is uh, 0.0020%, and the uh, loyalty rate for the iPad 2 is uh, 0.0070%. And uh, Thirdly, and as for damages and exceeding fund loyalty, uh, theoretically, uh, the stakeholder is entitled uh, to seek a compensation for damages based on Article 102, Paragraph 1 and Paragraph 2. But uh, uh, currently, we have uh, no rulings on this matter. So, and uh, finally, and uh, uh, I'd like to stress that the uh, a recent grand panel case, uh, which I mentioned in the, my written answer, might have effect on the determination of fund loyalty during infant lawsuits in a future case. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Kumagai Pansanim, Tapton Gamsamida. Thank you for your answer. 다음은 한국의 우성혁 보호판사님께서 답변해 Next, Mr. Wu Sang-yeop from yeah. Korea. Yeah. 교준 특허 침해를 원인으로 한 in the case of the damages claim for the infringement of standard essential patents, the issue is whether the patent holder can request the implementer to pay damages exceeding the royalty rate under friend. Regarding this, we need to see if the defendant is willing licensee. So regarding this, in Korea, if the defendant is the willing licensee, then the damages for the defendant will be limited to the amount equivalent to the royalty rate under a friend. If the defendant is unwilling licensee, according to the Samsung Apple case, um, decided by Seoul Central District Court, the damages for the defendant will include the lost profit of the patent holder and the infringer's profit from the act of infringement. And as for non-discriminatory requirements, in Korea, non-discriminatory does not mean that all licenses should be allowed to use the license under the same royalty rate under the same condition, but it means that there should be no discrimination in the treatment among the licenses with technically similar status and situation. So, even if there there's some gap in the royalty rate and conditions. We need to consider the scope of region of sales and the quantity of implementation and market share. So the gaps in the royalty rate and royalty conditions uh, could not be regarded as undermining the competition in the market. And also, when we calculate the damages on the SAP infringement, whether we should include the added value of the patent as the patent became a standard, and whether regarding royalty stacking, whether we select top-down approach and calculate the amount of damages, these two are still under great um, discussion and dispute. So far, we don't have a special case precedent, but in the academic sector, there are people who agree and also there are other people who disagree with this. Um, opinion. And whether we can have enhanced damages for unwilling licensee, in 2019, uh, Korea 
patent law created a threefold enhanced damages provision. So the threefold enhanced damages could be uh, allowed. And if that holder who made friend commitment does not start negotiation on license contract with the implementer or refuses to sign the friend commitment, um, re refuses to sign the license um, contract, that it could be regarded as the violation of friend uh, commitment. And if such exercise of the patent right is considered as the abuse of patent right, then the damages could be limited partially or entirely. Thank you for your answer. Next, Gra Judge Granata from Belgium. Are you ready to answer? Yes, I'm ready and I'll try to be very brief for the reason also, I hope you understand me, for the reason that damages is something secondary in IP infringement cases. Uh, mostly parties seem to settle. Secondly, it is important, uh, as I already mentioned, that uh, standard essential patent is patent. So it's the damages are calculated normally in the same way, the same way as a normal patent damages are calculated. In Belgium, actual damages should be proven. Uh, there exists no specific system to calculate IP damages other than the guidance possibly which is given by uh, Europe in its directive which you also will find in the questionnaire, a directive of April 29, 2004, on the enforcement of intellectual property rights. An important article uh, within that uh, directive is Article 13.1b, which actually gives uh, the possibility to national legislators to uh, hire the uh, real royalty, sometimes to double it. Of course, there, there is some discussion whether this is punitive or not punitive, for example, uh, in the case of an unwilling uh, licensee. A final point is uh, related to royalty stacking. Um, actually, in my opinion, there exists no consensus that royalty stacking is a real issue. And it's not known to me that in an actual case, a party has submitted actual proof regarding such a claim. Um, in the expert report of the European Commission, uh, the ultimate solution to solve this risk, could it be proven, would be to use patent, a patent pool system, which results in an aggregate royalty demand for all its uh, members. And that's where I can uh, uh, end my answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. In the case of Belgium, the damages calculation for SAP uh, is based on the calculation of damages for general IP. Uh, Judge Schaut from Germany. Thank you very much. Um, I can refer to what Judge Granata uh, said to the situation in, in Belgium. I think in Germany it's um, the same, uh, the um, uh, patent infringement cases, they are about to get the, in, uh, the injunction, um, not about to get uh, damages. As you may know, um, as I have said uh, before, it is um, um, rather, rather easy to, to get an injunction in Germany, at least, at least until now. Um, but it is rather difficult to, to get damages because they have to be calculated and there are so many ways to calculate them and you have to prove them. And so that is why uh, damages are not in the focus of patent infringement suits in Germany, but the injunction is. So um, that is why we don't have a, a very intensive discussion about uh, how to calculate or evaluate damages, damages in general for uh, patent infringement and especially um, 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 uh, calculating damages for SAP holders or SAP infringers. Uh, so um, I'm sorry that I cannot uh, provide any uh, specific uh, German consideration on, on the evaluation of, uh, uh, of damages. Um, we, we also know that there is the top-down approach, there are other approaches. We have no case law, especially not from our um, uh, Supreme Court. Uh, which which approach uh, is the right one, or which uh, which approach uh, sh should be applied? Um, from my personal view uh, point of view, I would also um, 
let's say, as Judge Granata said, there should be no, no different system uh, by calculating damages um, if, if we have SEPs and, um, uh, and an uh, implementer who is, uh, who is not a, a willing licen licen licensee. Thank you very much. Thank you for your answer. In the case of Germany, they focus more on the injunction order rather than damages. Judge Alexander from the UK, would you answer the question? Yes, thank you. There are considerable similarities with Germany and uh, Belgium. First of all, in uh, brand cases, there's no fundamental difference in the approach to uh, valuation of patents. There is considerable experience from uh, the pharmaceutical field and other uh, areas uh, where licenses have been uh, determined by the courts and the approach to evaluation is a similar one in principle. Uh, we have a, a very limited number of data points though. Really, so far, there is only one case, the Anwar Panit case, that has done a full and comprehensive analysis. In that case, the focus was on comparables uh, and quite a complicated assessment, uh, not based on agreements for the specific portfolio in issue, but seeking to uh, take results from a portfolio from which the portfolio was taken which required quite complicated accountancy calculations as to the proportion uh, of that portfolio which it represented. But the English courts also do top-down evaluation and to some extent do cross-checking from bottom up. There is no fixed approach and in the case law, it is possible that different approaches may develop for different portfolios and uh, different circumstances. So for example, there may be portfolios where there is no real track record of licensing. So there are no comparables uh, for that portfolio or the comparables that are put forward may be unreliable. In those circumstances, different methods may need to be uh, adopted. So we are in the middle of developing uh, that there's one further point just on comparables, which has emerged in the English case law on confidentiality. Uh, even last week, our Court of Appeal was looking at a, a situation where it was said that the comparable agreements were confidential. Who could see them? And that is potentially a, an issue if one is doing that kind of uh, uh, evaluation. And we will see how that uh, develops in the case law over the coming months. Thank you for your answer. Judge Bensi Mango from the US, are you ready to answer? Yes, thank you. So, statutorily, the patent holder is always entitled to no less than a reasonable royalty for patent infringement, but of course, you can always contract away your statutory rights. So, the court would look first to the FRAND agreement um, under contract law to determine what the royalty should be. And uh, that would be consider the, the policy, the owner's commitment at, the, at issue, um, and then include, and that can include then the value uh, flowing to the standard by its adoption. And the court should analyze the specific terms of the policy uh, to determine the scope and the meaning of the commitment and that may require looking at foreign uh, contract principles. But if the, um, the terms and the conditions are ambiguous, then uh, the court's going to turn more, li more likely than not to traditional patent law assessment. And at least the federal circuit here has said in that context, you don't look at any value flowing uh, to the patent from the standards adoption. Um, with regard to the stacking issue, uh, the court has been very specific that uh, simply out alleging it, um, and I think that um, the, all the previous judges have said it's, it's talked about, but there's not a lot of evidence of it, 
uh, and you need to have more than just an abstract recitation that of royalty stacking. You've got to provide some case-specific evidence, such as other licenses or royalty demands on the same standard before you can present that, certainly to a jury, and you probably even argue it to the judge. So, um, trying to keep it on schedule, so that's a short summary. That's all I have to say. 예, 배시병국 판사님 답변 감사합니다. Thank you very much for your 다음은, answer. Next 네. one. 네, 이번 세션의 세 번째 소주제. The third topic of the session. 어, 지금 두 번째 소주제가 특허권자에 대한 특허권자의 부재 소재 소재는 actually the third topic 소재 소재는 네, the means of remedies for implementers against SAP holders who breached the friend 특허권자가 프렌드 확약을 위반한 경우에 so if a SAP holder breaches its friend commitment then what kind of civil remedies exist for the implementer so if a patent holder declines to sign a license agreement with an implementer seeking to be a licensee without justifiable reason or demands a royalty rate that is unreasonable or discriminatory, question of what kind of remedies are available to the implementers becomes an issue. Can uh, SAP holder be liable for breach of contract uh, in a civil proceeding if the SAP holder committed a breach of friend commitment. And secondly, if a willing licensee who was refused a license agreement files a civil lawsuit against the SAP holder, could the willing licensee request an order for specific performance forcing the SAP to enter into license agreement? Uh, please answer the question in two minutes. Judge Alexander, would you answer the question? This is a very difficult question. We have no case law uh, on uh, this because the issue in which brand has arisen has really only been in circumstances where an implementer has sought to invoke uh, brand as a defense to proceedings uh, for infringement and to obtain a license on appropriate terms. In principle, as a matter of English law, the issue of remedies under the contract obviously will depend on the precise terms of the contract, which may in turn depend on what the relevant law is that governs the uh, um, uh, obligation that has been entered into by the uh, patent owner. So I, I don't think one can exclude that. The reason that I've put uh, the, or the entry is difficult to prove loss in the, in the slide is because um, ordinarily, the English court would say, well, there is a remedy here uh, that is readily invocable. If there is an infringed uh, and, and valid patent, we, the court, can settle what the relevant terms are. And we haven't yet had a situation where a patentee has refused to enter into a license that the English court has said is, in fact, friend. Um, I, I think that is not that likely to occur. One can imagine some situations in which it may, but uh, 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 the, the reason for a hesitant line in the entry is because it, it's an uncertain state of affairs. Thank you for your answer. Next, Professor Contreras from the U.S. Are you, please answer this question. Yes, thank you. Um, well, like uh, Judge Alexander has explained in the U.K., in the U.S. there hasn't been a, an adjudicated uh, judgment to specific performance in one of these cases yet but it is theoretically available. And in fact, um, though I did not uh, include this in my written response, uh, I, uh, there are four cases in the US in which specific performance has been addressed and discussed by courts uh, in dicta. Uh, as early as 1999 in ESS Technologies versus PCTEL, the court allowed uh, the party's um, motion for, or the uh, 
uh, the, the party's claim for specific performance to survive a motion to dismiss, um, saying that there was a claim that was stated uh, when the potential licensee uh, sought specific performance um, uh, in, by way of uh, getting a brand license granted. The issue was discussed much more in Apple versus Motorola in 2012, where the district court did conclude that specific performance could be an appropriate remedy under the circumstances of the case. And she said, in fact, it may be the only appropriate remedy um, in the case. However, uh, in that case, Apple said in court that it would not automatically accept the court's determination of a friend royalty rate, uh, but that it would consider um, that royalty rate in deciding whether or not to take a license. As a result of that, the judge dismissed the case, uh, saying that uh, if she determined a friend rate, it would simply be an advisory opinion, uh, which she was not willing to issue. And so the court declined to determine a friend rate and declined to grant specific performance to Apple because Apple would not commit to enter into the license. More recently, in 2019, this came up in two cases. In Continental versus Avanci, an automotive subsystem supplier sued for specific performance to obtain a SEP license when the SEP holder, Avanci, refused to grant such a license because it preferred to license the downstream automobile manufacturers, in particular Daimler. Uh, who was being sued in a German parallel case. This case, however, was dismissed in the US uh, because it was brought primarily on antitrust grounds, which is the topic of the next question. Um, and so the remedy uh, stage was never reached. And finally, in TCL versus Ericsson, the district court held that specific performance was an available remedy under the declaratory judgment request of TCL. However, in this case, uh, the question was also not finally adjudicated as the district court's decision was reversed by the federal circuit on other grounds, jury trial grounds. It's been uh, remanded back to the district court and that case is in process. So we do not have any issued remedy of specific performance in one of these cases, although it has been discussed in at least four cases in the past. And sir, and Judge Chui, uh, there is few discussions and no case on this issue in China. Uh, I think it's difficult for implementers to seek civil remedies against ICP holder in our country. First, in tort law, China's tort law provides that any person who infringes on civil rights and interests shall assume the tort liability. But I, if, if an ICP holder breaches its friend commitment, he only causes pure economic loss. But he doesn't infringe a specific civil right or interest listed in the law. The requirements of the protection of pure economic laws is a very complex issue. And in contract law, as I mentioned in the first section, with current interpretation of friend, implementers can't seek civil remedies under contract law, but under the new civil code, the parties can agree that a third party may directly request the debtor to perform the debt to him and if the debtor doesn't, the third party may request the debtor to assume the liability for breach of contract. Beyond that, uh, the theory of contracting fault liability is kind of reasonable, I think. It believes that friend impose pre-contract obligations. So we'll see if the opinions of scholars and the courts will change under the civil code. Thank you. That's all. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. Next judge, Kumagai from Japan. So would you please answer the question? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, 
there is no relevant uh, case or discussion directly dealing with uh, this issue in Japan. So I think that uh, uh, this problem is very difficult, so that uh, it depends on the legal nature of fund commitments. Uh, if the court finds that the uh, legal nature of the disputed fund commitment is a contractual one, so that the uh, uh, a compensation for damages based on the contract or order to take a specific action based on the contract are uh, permissible. Uh, but uh, if the court finds that uh, uh, this uh, disputed fund commitment uh, has not legal nature, just a voluntary one, so in my view, uh, theoretically, uh, the implementer can seek a compensation for damages uh, based on tort. So I think that it is very difficult for uh, implementer to seek, uh, uh, to request a court uh, to order take a specific action yeah, uh, for uh, for uh, stakeholder. So uh, anyway, so the uh, I think that the further discussions and the considerations are, are necessary to give a clear cut answer to this issue. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your answer. In Japan, they still um, under, they still need to have a more in-depth discussion. As Judge Kumagai said, there is a similar case in Korea. Civil remedies for willing licensee for breach of the friend commitment has not yet been been disputed in uh, Korean courts. Personally, I think in terms of whether an implementer can file a lawsuit against the breach of the friend commitment can be interpreted in depending on the content and details of the friend terms. If it is an offer to sell for a third party, if that's the case, theoretically, the third party can claim for specific performance of a license agreement and there is an agreement, there is a problem that more patents are declared to be essential than in fact are essential. So policy process which requires patent owners to declare SAP is in a timely manner when a standard is being prepared. So it will be very difficult to ask for damages. But based on the negotiation, obligation with negotiation in good faith, and the SAP holders are negotiating the contract terms in good faith. Face, there is a room for yeah. many interpretations. Thank you for your answer. Next, Judge Granata from Belgium, would you answer the question? Yes, I can actually refer uh, to the answers which already were given and referring that there is no actual case law at hand. Maybe uh, I could add if it would be seen as a contractual uh, breach of a contract. Again, this um, issue of applicable law emerges where we have to see, examine uh, which law applies to the commitment of the SAP holder toward uh, this implementer. It could also be considered possibly as a tort and there it would be a breach in the pre-contractual obligation during the licensing process. Okay. The SAP to enter into a license agreement. On the other hand, he could ask damages, and these damages will be calculated as a, assessed as a loss of a chance. The questionnaire where I explain how this loss of a chance approach would be considered by a judge. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. There have been technical glitches. Apologies. Uh, Judge Schaut from Germany. Thank you very much. I think 
I can be uh, brief because uh, almost everything has already been said. Um, the first, rest, first question, can an SCB holder be liable for breach of contract? Uh, I would say yes. Uh, according to German law, um, can you get damages uh, f by the reason of torts? I'm not so sure. And, um, and I, I can refer to the, uh, uh, to the other participants. Um, we don't have this uh, situation in, 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 in Germany. Uh, we don't have these constellations in, in cases before our courts. So I cannot give you any, um, any decision where this question has already uh, been uh, decided. So uh, my answer would be rather a theoretical. Um, but I said um, by contractual law, yes, there could be damages. And um, uh, by law of torts, I'm not so sure this uh, would have to be um, assessed in, in, in more detail according to the specific case. Um, also, a very interesting ca ca a question, um, if a willing licensee um, uh, can he uh, sue SCP holder to enter into a license agreement? I think we have a, we have such a case uh, at the regional court in Düsseldorf, where a Chinese uh, Chinese company sues an SCP holder uh, to enter into a license agreement. Um, but as far as I know, I'm from a regional court Munich, not from regional court uh, Düsseldorf. Um, I think this case has been stayed. Um, so I can't give you any specific uh, uh, details on that, but I think it's all, uh, also only uh, one case um, in which uh, this specific situation has been brought before a court and we have no decision yet. That's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge Shout, for your answer. Regarding this, across the world, it seems like there's no uh, case law, and many countries are having discussion on this. Last topic, last question. So if the SCP holder violated the a uh, friend commitment, will there be remedy for the implementer in terms of the antitrust law? Uh, legal disputes surrounding whether licensing strategies constitute violation of antitrust laws are taking place around the world. The extent to which antitrust law can be applied to the exercise of a patent right is very important. And what is the uh, relationship between a breach of friend commitment by a SAP holder and a violation of antitrust law? And could you explain uh, if there's any case that demonstrate where a breach of friend commitment constitutes violation of antitrust law? Please answer the question in three minutes. Judge Alexander from the UK, would you start? Thank you again. Uh, we have here also very limited data points. Uh, in the uh, Unwired Planet case, the uh, English court confirmed essentially the, the EU case law that it could be a violation of antitrust law, for example, to bring a uh, claim without reasonable notice or prior consultation with the potential implementer. So, in theory, that could constitute a violation of um, antitrust law. However, in practice, that is very likely, uh, unlikely to uh, be an issue because it's difficult to imagine circumstances in which an SEP holder won't have at least tried to obtain um, royalties from an implementer in one way or another, or at least put um, a licensing scheme up for potential acceptance. So while that provides a potential remedy, in practice, uh, I'm not convinced that it is a particularly uh, practical one. And we have no case in the United Kingdom where an antitrust violation has been found. Second point is that as the Unwired Planet case held, merely requesting terms that are in fact not frank, so making a proposal that is too high, even very much too high, I mean multiples too high, is not regarded a violation of antitrust law uh, uh, as such. And so the, there are real practical difficulties in an, uh, obtaining a remedy based on antitrust law in the United Kingdom. 
I base my answers on the current state of play, which is that EU uh, principles apply. We're, of course, facing uh, uh, the uh, prospect of complete Brexit at the end of the year, when our antitrust laws may potentially change somewhat. Uh, and uh, the position may, of course, change. I think in this area, they're unlikely to change very significantly. Thank you for your answer. Next, Professor Contreras from the U.S., would you answer the question, please? Yes, certainly. Uh, so, at the moment, uh, the pendulum in the U.S. has swung toward the side of this question that would suggest that there is not a significant antitrust liability associated with uh, violating a FRAND commitment. The type of liability that one would consider here is liability for unilateral conduct by the SEP holder, uh, what we call monopolization or attempted monopolization under Section 2 of the Sherman Act. Um, there have been two recent cases in which those types of monopolization claims uh, for Fran violations were rejected by the courts. FTC versus Qualcomm, um, in which the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals rejected uh, antitrust claims made against Qualcomm for a variety of um, alleged uh, violations of its Fran commitments, violations that had been found by the lower court to constitute violations of the Sherman Act, uh, but that was reversed by the Court of Appeals. Likewise, in Continental versus Avanci, which I mentioned, uh, there the district court dismissed the case on the basis that it did not find that Avanci's refusal to license an automotive subsystem manufacturer under SEPs uh, was an antitrust violation. Uh, the case was silent about the contractual violation uh, but uh, the case was dismissed on the basis that it was not an antitrust violation. Compounding this, the U.S. Department of Justice has, over the past couple of years, expressed significant doubt about antitrust violations for such unilateral conduct based on breaches of FRAN commitments. That being said, there are two antitrust enforcement agencies in the United States, the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission. The Federal Trade Commission has taken a different view um, and the Federal Trade Commission operates under a different statute, uh, the FTC Act in the United States, which has a section, uh, section five, which prohibits unfair methods of competition. And in the past, the FTC has prosecuted actions against potential violations of FRAND commitments under section five of the FTC Act. Uh, such cases were brought in uh, N data um, where a transferee of a patent failed to honor the original owner's brand commitment and uh, actions were brought against Google, Motorola, and uh, Robert Bosch, um, those companies for seeking or threatening to seek injunctions um, against um, implementers of standards when they had made brand commitments. All of these cases were resolved through consent decrees between the FTC and the party. So none of these cases went to adjudication either, uh, but clearly it was the FTC's position that these were violations of the FTC Act. And I would conclude by saying, of course, in other areas of standard setting, there have been numerous antitrust cases, uh, mostly disclosure and uh, patent ambush cases, the famous series of cases involving Rambus, in the 90s and early 2000s, as well as Broadcom versus Qualcomm and others uh, have focused on compliance with the disclosure and other SDO rules, not on the particulars of the FRAND commitment. But with respect to the FRAND commitment, we really do not have um, any uh, antitrust liability of any meaningful nature that has been found. Thank you for your answer. Next, Judge Zhui from China. 
예, 답변 부탁드리겠습니다. Thank you for the answer. Next, Judge Kumagai from Japan. Japanese Antitrust Act and provides that the exercise of IP rights, including patent rights, basically does not constitute a violation of Antitrust Act. However, recently, Japan Fair Trade Commission, JFTC, recognized that in some special cases, the exercise of IP rights may constitute a violation of Antitrust Act. And uh, now currently, uh, JFTC published the guideline for this. And uh, because, as I mentioned earlier, the IP High Court adopted the uh, so-called abuse of right to approach in the Samsung Apple case uh, for the ground-related cases, the relationship uh, between the Antitrust Act and the Friend Commitment has not been consciously discussed in Japan. And uh, so, but in relation to the, this issue, so we have a Blu-ray LLC case, uh, which and I mentioned in the, my written answer. In this and uh, Blu-ray LLC case, the panel of Tokyo District Court and uh, JFTC both found the act of a set holder. So, in this case, a uh, set holder notifies the infringement by the defendant to the major retailers. So, the such act and uh, constitutes uh, the violation of antitrust act. And for further details, uh, please refer to my answer. Yes. That's the end of my answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your answer. Judge Kim Gisu. Thank you very much. The Patent Act and the Fair Trade Act serve the same purpose in that they promote consumer welfare and dynamic market environment for technical innovations, technological innovations. Therefore, the fair exercise of patent rights does not violate the Fair Trade Act unless it goes against the purpose. According to Article 59 of the Fair Trade Act, you can, you can see the Korean providers. Korea provides that the Fair Trade Act does not apply to the acts determined to be legitimate exercise of the rights under the Copyright Act. Meanwhile, acts that appear to be used for exercise of patent rights but are against the purpose of the Patent Act and restrict competition in substance should not be exempt from the Fair Trade Act merely because they happen to be used or exercise of patent rights. A breach of a friend commitment is clearly an act that may be suspected as going against the purpose of the Patent Act. However, it should not be deemed that the SAP holders exercise of patent rights in breach of its friend commitment is always against the purpose of the Patent Act. So a clear look into the acts of restrict effect on 
공정 거래법 위반 여부가 문제되는 부분입니다. Patent litigation between Samsung and Apple, and another litigation between Qualcomm. 특허 소진을 회피하여 이익을 극대화하기 위해서 in order to maximize benefits by each of them, without entering into another contractual agreement, there was a friend commitment between the parties, and it was a very interesting case for the perspective of fair trade. 모뎀 칩셋 제조사의 제조사의 라이센스를 거절한 퀄컴의 행위가 시장 지배적 지위의 남용 행위 중에서 정상적인 거래 가능에 비추어 타당성 없는 조건을 제시하여 다른 사업자의 활동을 부당하게 방해한 행위라고 보았습니다. 현재 위 사건은 선고되어 대법원에 계류 중입니다. 감사합니다. 음, 김기수 판사님의 상세한 답변. Thank you very much for your answer. Next, Judge Granada from Belgium, would you answer the question? Yes, thank you. Of course, central in the discussion is uh, the holding of a dominant position, uh, where one could argue that a SAP holder should as such be considered dominant due to the essentiality of the patent and following the lack of alternative technology Situation may occur, though, that the SAP holder holds no dominant position. This assessment, as for most cases, uh, to be dealt with before court depends on the facts of the case, uh, where technology, uh, the underlying technology uh, in which the discussion is situated, may have some importance. And I refer specifically to the opinion of the Advocate General Watelet in the uh, already mentioned case, Huawei versus CTE. Examples of factual situations which could ri give rise to a higher barrier compared to the non-discriminatory evaluation could be, for example, a royalty rate higher to firms competing with the own standard compliant products. As a personal note, I could add that where it would be attractive to make use of the competition law principles to assess the non-discriminatory prong of the friend commitment, we should take into to account that where discriminatory licensing terms and conditions are ipso facto in violation of the non-discriminatory commitment made by the SAP holder, the FR, fair and reasonable, in combination with the non-discriminatory prong, could hold licensing terms and conditions impermissible while they could be allowable under antitrust law. But as mentioned, there is no actual case law where this has actually been addressed. That's my answer to this question. Thank you very much for your answer. Next, Judge Schaut from Germany. Thank you very much. Um, yes, also in Germany we have no specific case law on this. Um, I think um, there are two questions. So the first question will be the, the front commitment. Uh, which we discussed earlier, whether it's declaratory or whether it has uh, some, some uh, binding effect uh, due to a contractual law. Uh, and there's the antitrust uh, um, um, uh, uh, theory. So um, in Germany, we usually, as I said before, we, uh, we solve the cases uh, if we have a SEP holder and uh, it is proven that uh, his patent is standard essential um, we apply the uh, EU antitrust law, uh, and then also, of course, then the uh, also already mentioned uh, decision of the um, EU court, uh, um, uh, Huawei versus ZTE. Um, and if the uh, if the SCP holder is not uh, ob um, uh, complying with his uh, its uh, obligations to front, not giving a, a, a front license, offering a front a front license uh, to the implementer. He will not be allowed to uh, claim an injunction or a revocation of the products of the of the infringer. 
uh, I think so this is maybe the, the, the uh, link between uh, front commitment or, or friendly, uh, um, uh, friendly behavior of the, uh, of the SEP holder and the antitrust law. Thank you very much. Thank you for your answer. This will be all for our Q&As. So, among panelists and speakers, would you like to ask any question to the other panel? Or if you would like to add anything, please uh, make comments. Uh, Judge Alexander, would you like to add something? Or do you have a question or anything uh, would you like to say? No, just to thank the other speakers for extremely clear presentations and uh, uh, to, just to apologize for not being able to provide uh, clearer guidance from the uh, English and the United Kingdom front on some of these very difficult issues. Thank you. Judge Ben Sibenko? Do you have any questions? I don't have any questions. I'd like to join uh, the previous speaker in, in thanking you as well for inviting me to participate. This is a very uh, rapidly changing and evolving area. Um, and I think that uh, I, what I heard was a lot of consistency from across the countries about where the concerns are and, and the approach. And, and uh, while uh, the issues keep coming to the front, they're not getting battled out in court a lot. They seem to be resolving. Uh, uh, if they, people don't get what they want right away, they go off and arbitrate or settle, uh, which doesn't help. I, it, I, I don't want to decide them myself, but necessarily we don't get to get things to go up to the appellate courts to get final guidance if, if parties are going to do it on their own. But if that's the way they want to do it, that's fine too. Anyway, thank you all for inviting me. I enjoyed being part of the program. Ah, yeah, 감사합니다. 다음 미국의 콘트레라스 교수님. Professor Contreras from the U.S. Do you have any questions? Uh, no, no questions, uh, but uh, like the others, I, I would um, uh, just express, I, I, I actually learned very much from this presentation and, and I have really come to appreciate how there are really more questions and answers all around the world on these topics. So uh, this is, this is a, a topic that will continue to provide fruitful discussion uh, for many years and many conferences to come. So thank you very much for inviting me to participate. Yeah, thank you. Judge Chui from China. Do you have questions? No questions. And uh, I'd like to clarify, I'm from the IP court of the China Supreme People's Court, which was established on January 1st last year. And we take charge all, uh, all cases on appeal nationwide. And as a member of this new institution, again, I feel very honored to be invited to attend to this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Judge Granada from Belgium, do you have questions? Judge Granada, do you have questions? No, I also wish to thank you. Ah, yeah, 감사합니다. Thank you. Uh, 일본의 쿠마가이 판사님. Judge Kumagai from Japan. Do you have any questions? Uh, no, thank you. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, for uh, for my my Korean friends uh, for organizing such a great event. So. I'm really impressed to know the latest development of the issues surrounding uh, ground and, uh, and SEP. Uh, so uh, recently, uh, we so but uh, information technology and uh, the, uh, is changing very rapidly. 
now we are facing a very common problem all over the world. Uh, it, uh, it is very great chance for me to share the precious knowledge uh, with the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Schaut from Germany, do you have questions? Uh, actually, I, I have a lot of questions, um, but due to the fact that it's uh, uh, four o'clock in the morning here in Germany and that I will be uh, uh, requested in office in about uh, four hours, I will refrain from uh, posing or for, from questioning all my questions now. Um, and it remains to me also to, to thank you very much uh, for, your, um, uh, for, uh, for giving me the, the possibility uh, to take part of this um, uh, great panel. And, uh, and I hope uh, we, can, we can continue these fruitful discussions in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, time's almost up, but does anyone from the floor have a question? If not, we'd like to conclude the session. I would like to thank all the panels and speakers and participants for the session. Please give the presenters and speakers a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. This will be all for the fifth session. Thank you very much, speakers, panels, and the moderator. Please give them another round of applause.